welcome. Part two of Making Relationships Great. A quick three minute recap of what we covered last week, or two weeks ago rather. We explained the goal of the series is pretty simple, which is to enhance and to improve relationships in general and marriage in particular. We spoke about our changing world and how our interactions are so drastically different now than they were even 10 years ago with the advent of Facebook and other forms of social media, which we're trying to adjust to. We mentioned why we have friends. Besides the basic human need of companionship, we quoted from the Rabbeinu Yonah, one of the great rabbinic authorities in the 13th century, that he said there are three benefits of having good friends. Number one was to understand life better. Having someone you could speak to and bring up real issues, big questions, not be ashamed or embarrassed to speak about life and therefore grow together. That's reason number one. Number two, he mentioned, it's a form of receiving constructive criticism. Only a good friend will tell you when he thinks you're off base and when he does or she does, they have the ability or at least the potential to do so in a way where you might accept it. So constructive criticism and the third thing was it helps us or it enables us to become a giver. Without having to be a good friend you'll never learn to give. We can meditate for years upon years in the mountaintop and reach high levels of elevation and spirituality but you'll never learn to be a giver unless you have to relate to somebody else. We spoke about the distinction between peer pressure and peer perception. Peer perception is the idea that the way people around me view reality will directly affect the way I view reality and therefore choosing a good friend is not just about who I want to hang out with but it's how I want to see the world knowing very well that they will have a major influence on the way I perceive life around me. A good example of that is if you're friendly with someone who's constantly negative, always pessimistic. It's infectious, it's contagious. And you begin to see the world in those terms, in those dark, gloomy, it's a whole different perception. So who we're with greatly affects how we see ourselves and the world around us. And we left off by saying that the first step to becoming a good friend or a good spouse is becoming a friend to yourself. And that means, number one, know thyself, understand who I am, and then number two is being understanding of who I am, being able to forgive myself, being able to feel I do make mistakes, that doesn't therefore make me a failure. We spoke about negative self-talk, the way we speak to ourselves, we have to be cautious. Don't always put yourself down. That's the first step to becoming a good friend, and that was really based on the famous verse in the Torah, Ve'ahavta which is to love your fellow as yourself, and the first step is, we see, you have to love yourself. That was last time. The goal of tonight is to transition from generic friendship and go towards real relationships, man and woman, husband and wife. Now before we jump into marriage, I think it's appropriate to try and tackle a very, very ambiguous term, which we all use all the time, and many of us don't really know how to define it, which is love. I love you. I'll see you later. Have a great day. Love ya. What does that mean? What in the world is the definition of love? Any ideas? Eric? <laughs> Jason? <laughs> Jan? <laughs> Cute. It's a broad and very generic, very misused, and sometimes overly used term that we're not quite sure what it means. Emily Dickinson wrote, all I know of love is that love is all there is. Which basically means, I have no idea what exactly it is, but I know it's very important. 
I want to be loved, I want to be able to love others. How do you define it? I'm not quite sure. I want to show you a two-minute clip here from Fiddler on the Roof to give us a little bit of a perspective on what love may be. I hit the lights. So there we have it, Fiddler on the Roof, the definition of love. I happen to believe I happen to believe it's a wonderful play, wonderful movie, but it does portray many ideas in life in Judaism in a very childish way a lack of sophistication, a lack of understanding. Perhaps the most famous example in Fiddler on the Roof is the song, Tradition. What was the, what was the point of that song? Who here has not seen Fiddler on the Roof? Don't be embarrassed. Okay, okay. You'll have to see it at some point in life. Okay. The goal of the song of tradition, it's tradition. He was basically saying, I have no idea why we're doing what we're doing, but this is what's been passed on throughout the generations. I follow blindly, having no concept, having no understanding. That's not a Jewish value. What is love? So after 25 years, I've washed your clothes and made your bed and cleaned your house, milked your cow and given you children. If that's not love, what is? Doesn't really quite answer the question. I want to ask you three questions. Number one is, what is love? Number two is, can love be obligated? Can I command you to love a person, place, or thing? Question number three is, 
do we believe in love at first sight? Is that possible? You hear these stories. I saw her across the room and her eyes met and I just, I knew it right away. I was destined to marry her. What is love? Can we command love? Do we believe in love at first sight? There's a authentic book within the genre of classic Western philosophy, which I like to quote often because I think it tells us a lot about where we get our ideas from. I've quoted this before, a different passage, but now I'd like to share with you from later on in the book, Sleeping Beauty. As she's living away in the countryside, hiding from the mean witch, it tells us that Briar Rose danced and sang with her friends, the birds and animals. She told them of her beautiful dream about meeting a tall, handsome stranger and falling in love. One second. It's her dancing. A handsome young man came riding by. When he heard Briar Rose singing, he jumped from his horse and hid in the bushes to watch her. Then he reached out to take her hand. Briar Rose was startled. I didn't mean to frighten you, the young man smiled. But I feel like we've met before. It's a nice opening line. I feel like we've met before. Briar Rose felt very happy. She and her admirer gazed into each other's eyes. The young man didn't know she was actually a princess. And she didn't know that he was Prince Philip, to whom she had been betrothed many years before. So here we have it, dreaming of a tall, handsome prince, and finally to gaze into each other's eyes, and they're falling in love, and you jump to the end of the book, after everyone is taken care of, and now she's in this trance, she's sleeping, Philip raced to the tower where his love lay sleeping. Gently he kissed her. Her eyes slowly opened. She was awake. Now everyone awoke, smiling. The king and queen were overjoyed to see Aurora again, and wedding plans were soon made. The good fairies were blissful too. It had all ended just the way it should, happily ever after. So you walk away from this as a child, and you're getting a lot of very deep-rooted messages. Number one, what is love? Tall, handsome young man. I'll gaze into his eyes, and we'll see each other for the first time. And that's it. We'll feel it. We'll know it. And then once you make the wedding plans, then it's happily ever after. This is what we're taught as children, and this is actually pervasive in our culture. <clears throat> I'd like to now go back to the source of wisdom, the Torah itself, and try to actually analyze the story of creation. Look at that narrative very carefully and see perhaps a very different perspective on love from the Torah's uh, viewpoint. In the beginning where it speaks about the creation of the human being, the Torah tells us, Va'adam yoda es chava ishto that Adam knew his wife, Chava, Eve, and she bore a child. What does that mean, he knew her? In the biblical sense, that means they were intimate. Interesting way of saying it, though. Again, we have another time where the Torah refers to love or intimacy in the form of yediyah, based on knowledge or knowing. It says regarding the relationship that God had with Abraham. God is saying that I have loved Abraham because he has instructed his family and his household after him to follow the path of God to do that which is just and right. I have loved him. What's the Hebrew for that? What does that mean, literally? I have known him. Right. So we see these are two examples, and there are many others as well, where the Torah will use the word knowledge to tell you that I love you. What is that teaching us? That love 
is a product or the result of knowledge. When I know you and I see your qualities and therefore I appreciate who you are, then my natural reaction as a human being is I have this, this emotion where I want to connect with you. I'm attracted to those qualities and therefore I want to be closer to you. That feeling is love. But that feeling only comes from yadiyah, from an understanding and an awareness of who you are. That brings on love. Question. So the truth is, is there such a thing? Is there a human being that truly has no good qualities? You know, there might be exceptions. And sometimes we're actually commanded to hate people. Hate philosophies, hate ideas, or even hate people if they're truly evil. But in general, a person might have many flaws, they might make many mistakes, they might say the wrong thing and hurt your feelings and lack sensitivity. But there's always good within a human being. Seeing that good, being aware of that quality or qualities, that brings on love. So the definition of love is the feeling of wanting to connect with another thing or human being based on a recognition of what this is. I want to be part of that. This is true not just in regards to relationships between people, but it's even true in how we connect with the God, with the infinite creator of the universe. The Rambam, Maimonides, one of the great rabbinic authorities in the 11th century, he has the following question. We know that we say in the Shema twice a day, it's a commandment, an obligation in the Torah, that we have to love the creator of the universe. So how in the world do you do that? How do you love God? It's a very difficult thing to do. So writes Maimonides, the way to get there is analyze the world around you, look at the creations, how wondrous they are, the intricacy of the universe, how everything fits together, this tapestry of wisdom, that Ain Kate, so there's no limit to how much beauty and, and wisdom we find in the universe. And he writes very interestingly, Miyad, as soon as you pick up on that, as soon as you focus on how vast the world is, how complex everything is, then immediately the natural response is, you have this deep-rooted desire to connect with the creator of this reality. So the same way we love a human being by spending time together, doing coffee, getting to know you, and then I pick up on those qualities, I appreciate who you are, and that creates that emotion of love, that applies to God as well. How do we get to know God? We get to know His universe. We get to know the creations. And when we see the depth and the profundity of the world around us, that inspires this feeling of, I want to connect with the Creator of this world. That's what love is. So therefore, to answer our three questions, number one, what is love? It's the direct or immediate natural human response to seeing qualities. That's what love is. Number two, can love be commanded, therefore? What would you say? Well, if the definition of love is just this romantic feeling, it's hard to command that. It's hard to tell me I have to feel that way. I have it or I don't. But if love is the result of seeing somebody's qualities, then you could tell me you are obligated as a human being to try to find the good in others. And that itself brings on love. So you can't obligate me to love people, or to love God for that matter. All you're really saying is, look for the good in others, and that'll bring on love automatically. The third question is, do we believe in love at first sight? Can that exist? Based on this definition of love, the answer is, no, why not? Right, you have no idea who that person is. And I'll tell you, the majority of times that initial clicking happens, fast forward three weeks or three months, it's over. It's done with. 
what happened? It was so real, it was so powerful in the beginning. The answer is, you didn't really know him. And then when you got a chance to know him better, things changed drastically. Right, that, that's almost more instinctual, I think. You know, that's part of the human beings and even animals on some level. You have the instinctive love for your, your child. Now, there are two different types of love we have to keep in mind, and these can get confusing. The Mishnah tells us that any love that is dependent on something else, on an outside factor, once that factor falls away, the love falls away. If I only love him because he's tall and handsome and charming, and then we get married and we fast forward 10 years, and he's bald and fat and lazy, there goes the love. That's it. Continues the Mishnah. However, if you love someone not based on anything external, but because of an understanding or an appreciation of their qualities, so then, that lasts forever. That's enduring. Now, if you had to guess, to give me one reason why there are so many divorces nowadays. This has been a trend for the last 20, 30 years. I've actually seen some research that indicates it's getting a little bit better now. The last couple of years, actually better than the early part of the 2000s or the 90s. Whatever it is, though, it's still up around 50 someone percent. If you get married, you're not going to last more than the average time is eight years. Answer is, you didn't read the Mishnah. The Mishnah is telling you very clearly, any love that is based on something external, it's not going to last. Because anything external by definition fades away at some point, and when that's gone, I married her initially, she was gorgeous, but then she had three babies. A different person, I can't recognize her anymore. When the external thing fades away, if the love's based on that, the love is gone as well. So we have to keep in mind, that's external love. Let's say I love you because you do so many beautiful things for me. I appreciate you, I have gratitude towards you. What category of love does that fall into? Is that A, real, authentic, pure love? Or is it B, I'm loving you because of an external factor? By a show of hands, who says B? Who says A? What? What do you mean? Basically, it comes down to, why am I loving you because you are benefiting me? Is it because it's me that's receiving the good? But if theoretically you were giving things or being nice and, and pleasant to other people, I wouldn't love you because I'm not getting anything? If that's the case, clearly it's B. That's a love that's based on, I'm receiving something from you and therefore I like you. My own selfish interest. But if it's, I see that you give to me, and I appreciate that quality of selflessness, and I love you because of that, that's love A. That's the real deal. The litmus test is, if I would ask myself that question, if I wasn't gaining as much from him as I am now, but I still saw those qualities of his giving and, and selflessness, would I love him as well? If the answer is yes, then you know it's real. So two types of love. In Western society, like we saw from Sleeping Beauty, and really all throughout the media, love is portrayed in a very different way. It's painted for us as a form of self-gratification. What can I gain from this? That's what love is. In every movie, I can't say every movie, but in the majority of movies out there that deal with some kind of romantic relationship, 
Why is it that the guy is chasing after the girl or vice versa? 99% of the time, it's not because I understand who she is and she's such a wonderful person, I want to connect with that. No. It's based on something external, it's not real, and it fades away. And that's what's shoved into our minds from the youngest of ages. So it's very hard to have a radically different approach. But when we analyze again the creation narrative, we see, going back to the very beginning, the Torah says, that God created the human being in His image. In the image of God, He created him. He created this human being, which means, beautifully said, <laughs> male and female. Oh, the Talmud asked that question. The Talmud says, when you read the beginning of Genesis, it sounds like there's two different stories. The initial story is where God creates a human being, and it seems to be both genders. Zachar and Akeva, it's both male and female, but it's one human being. And then, the second creation narrative, Sounds like it says there was man that was created and then out of man from his rib or from his side came the woman. So what happened? Make up your mind. So the Talmud says they're both true. Initially, the first human being that was ever created was actually a combination of male and female. Now, just parenthetically, whenever we address this part of the Torah, the creation story, the flood, the tower of, of bubble, we can't really have any image as to what took place. The goal is to learn lessons from the Torah and to apply it. To have any picture in our minds of what it looked like, that's well above and beyond us. But at least initially, the first human being was actually both male and female, and only then there was a separation in genders. You had men and you had women. Question. Fiddler on the roof, that's true. <laughs> it's a very good question, very insightful question. That if we're defining love as knowing the person, seeing their qualities, and therefore loving them, if you're meeting them for the first time under the chuppah, you probably don't have that love. And I'll tell you the truth even if you date that person for six months to a year, very likely you don't have that love either. To really get to that level of selfless love, where I'm attracted to you because I see who you are, that potentially could take 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So to answer your question, you're right. You can't have real love before marriage, but that's not the Torah guideline for marriage. There's no need to love someone before getting married. The goal is to have enough in common with that person, to see potential, to like spending time together, if you have that, then uh, love will come. It has to be worked on. It doesn't come by itself. So the truth is, when you buy a car, what do you do before you buy the car? Take it for a test drive, right? That makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. I'm not going to spend $15,000 on this thing before I drive around the block a couple of times. See how the seats feel and see how the, you know, the pickup is. So to apply that to dating and marriage would also make sense theoretically. Let's go for a test drive. Let's live together for eight years before we get married just to make sure we're not going to totally get on each other's nerves. 
And then you're better off that way, right? Not necessarily. The truth is, if you look in the research, and things are changing now, initially, going back a couple of years, the research said that living together consistently for years before marriage, you have a greater odd, and we're talking not just 5 or 10%, but it said 30 to 40 to 50% higher chances of divorce. Recently, they're changing that. I think around two thirds of Americans do live together before getting married, and there might not be such a, a basis to say that if you live together beforehand, you're more likely to get divorced. That might not be true. The question is, does it make it better? Is it a good test drive? And the answer is no. What's the difference between living together before marriage and test driving a car? Why is one a valid test and one is not? Well, when you drive that car, even though I haven't committed to buying the car yet, it's the same exact drive as it will be once it's your car. When you're living with another human being and you don't have the commitment, you're not really test driving marriage. It's a whole different relationship. It's a whole different dynamic. So it doesn't necessarily work. Yes. <laughs> it's a much bigger question when you're getting married. That's true. <laughs> right. It happens to be even even that form of arranged marriage that saw on Fiddler on the Roof, where he said, I, I met you for the first time under the chuppah at the wedding day, the Talmud says that's not allowed. Why? Because we're concerned that you might grow to hate someone if you don't meet them beforehand. It's a pretty valid concern. Because I never met you before, now my parents are forcing me to marry you, and your parents are forcing you to marry me and we have nothing in common, I can't stand being with you, it's not destined to be a beautiful marriage. So the idea of getting to know someone beforehand is definitely a Torah idea, and that's something that's really done in all even traditional circles. The question is, how well do you get to know them? Right? So the idea of living here for, for, for eight years, that we feel there's no need for that. But uh, if you're dating for three months, you're dating for six months, that depends on the individual. So at least that we see this interesting fact that the creation of the first human being was a combination of male and female, and only afterwards were they separated into two different genders. And the question is why? If we're destined to be different, and indeed we're very different, so then create us like that way in the first place. Why are you playing games, God? You're going to start off creating one entity and then split it in half, just make us separate in the first place. So I'll share with you an insight of the Vilna Gaon, one of the great thinkers of the 1700s. He explains that the goal of male and female of human beings is to unite and to become one. The way to make that union natural and, and something that's almost intuitive is by the initial creation actually making man and woman as one. That way when we find each other again, it's almost as if I'm finding my other half. Even though I'm so different from you, I see the world drastically different. I don't like the lasagna. You can't stand football. But it doesn't make a difference. Because innately there's this connection that we have and when we're together again, it's natural coming back to the source. And that's the goal of marriage. Question. Well, there's no such thing as wasting time like that. You know, we believe that everything in life is part of a grand plan, and we have to make the best decision we can. Are you allowed to get divorced in Jewish law? Are you sometimes obligated to get divorced in Jewish law? Yes. So 
Although it's not the ideal, and we don't go into marriage saying, listen, we'll give it a shot, doesn't work out in a couple of years, fine, divorce her and find someone else. That's not our perspective. But at the same time, the Torah does take into consideration the realities of the world. And you do have situations where it's just not working and it's not going to work. And therefore, the right thing is, it's actually a mitzvah. The mitzvah in that given situation is, call it a day and move on. Now, we're going to explore what's a valid reason for divorce. We're just not having fun anymore. It's not exciting. I just lost that thrill we had when we were dating. Let's call it a day. And you hear that. You do hear that. So we're going to explore exactly what, the, what a valid reason for divorce may be. But that's the Vilna Gaon telling us that from the very beginning of creation, the human being was created as one to make it that ultimately that union is natural and really connecting to our other half. Now why is it needed? Why do we need to feel this union, this, that the Torah's term is devakis, this connection? Why do we need that? What's the point of that? Well, in secular society, or in Sleeping Beauty, the answer would be, because that's great. Everyone wants to feel that way. Finding your, your loved one, living happily ever after. Who wouldn't want that? And that's true. We would all want that. But that's not why we're striving for unity in marriage. We're doing it for a much glow, a bigger, more universal ideal, which is, I want to maximize my potential in this world. I want you to maximize your potential in this world. If we work together to support each other as partners, as lovers, shooting for the same goals, then we're going to reach a lot higher than we could do by ourselves. So it's not about what I'm gaining. I want to become one with you so it feels good. It's a lot more than that. I want to become one with you because only through that connection can we together really strive for higher and higher accomplishments. That's the Torah perspective as to why we want to create this unity. Now what is unique to marriage that a friendship doesn't have? Clearly there are many technicalities. But if we spoke about friendship the first time we got together and we gave some basic guidelines and we said the purpose is to understand life better, to receive constructive criticism, and to become more of a giver, those three things apply to marriage as well, and even more so. So what's unique about marriage that a friendship cannot have? What's that? I mean, theoretically, you could raise the family with a friend, theoretically. Exclusivity. Commitment. Very good. That's another thing, right? Intimacy, that level of closeness with the spouse, does not exist in any other relationship. I think that might be included in, you know, commitment. That when we're together, I'm promising we're going to stay together. So you have the commitment factor and you have the intimacy factor. Those things do not and cannot exist in a regular friendship. At the same time, you're more vulnerable in a marriage. That relationship is the most vulnerable relationship you have as a human being. You're totally exposed to that person. They know you. They know everything about you. They can read you like an open book. And therefore, there's more potential for greater connection and intimacy, but at the same time, there's more potential for feelings of rejection and disappointment. The more I allow myself to open up to you, the more we have that ability to really become one, but at the same time, we have the, that ability to really hurt each other. If we're just good friends, how often do you have a good buddy that you play tennis with and you schmooze, you talk a little bit about things happening or the movie you saw last week? How often do you really hurt each other's feelings when you walk away after a conversation feeling devastated and rejected? 
Not that often. But yet, with a spouse, it's pretty often. It happens. Because I'm more vulnerable. I'm more open to you, and therefore I can become closer, but I'm also hurt more. So that, that's what's unique about a marriage. Now what I want to do is take these elements, commitment, intimacy, and see, to flesh it out a little bit, what it means practically. We're going to start with commitment tonight, and hopefully next time get to intimacy in the metaphorical sense and in the physical sense as well. But I want to start with commitment. If you ask a young man about to get married, or a young woman, what is the foundation of marriage? The, the building block to really have a good, healthy, vibrant marriage. And I'll give you three choices, you have to guess which one it is. Love, mutual understanding, or respect. Or D, none of the above. Anyone for love, raise your hand. Okay. Or all of the above. Anyone for A, raise your hand. Love. No. Do you know why it can't be love? Because love doesn't exist. Real love, category A love, selfless love. I know you, I recognize you, and therefore I'm attracted to you. That's not there in the beginning. That may take decades. So that can't be the building block. That can't be the foundation. Option number two is mutual understanding. We understand each other, and it's based on that we're going to build a relationship. Anybody married in this room? Okay. How, how often, I want to ask the men this question, how often would you say, on a scale of one to ten, do you understand where your wife is coming from? Ten being always, one being really never, five somewhere in the middle. Five? See, we have two men who don't have their wives with them, so they can be more honest. I'm not going to ask you to answer that question. And I think the same thing is true from the women's perspective. I have no idea what you're saying, honey. I think you're crazy. So to build anything based on a mutual understanding, the answer is, it's not consistent. To have a foundation by definition means it has to always be there. Love is not there yet. Even when it is, it's not consistent. Mutual understanding is not always there. How about respect? You like respect. Again, from the men who don't have their wives here, do you always respect your wife on a scale of 1 to 10? Or do you sometimes feel that I, I love her and I respect her in general? This particular decision, it's hard for me to respect. It's hard for me to feel that level of of, of dignity and, and, and looking up to her when she's doing these types of things. Respect is not a constant either. So it's not love, it's not understanding, and it's not respect. Are all of these things crucial for a healthy marriage? Of course they are. But when you're talking foundation, it's something else entirely. What is that something else? It's commitment. Responsibility. That's something that no matter how you feel about him or how he feels about you, no matter what just happened or what he said, that's always there. I have a responsibility, I have an obligation to try my best to make this work. And what you're really doing is psychologically something very profound. If it's about love and respect and understanding, then that means I'm really kind of looking inwards. How, how I feel about you. And oftentimes, I might not feel consistently in the same way. If it's about responsibility or commitment, then the question is, it doesn't make a difference how I feel about it right now. Maybe I don't like you right now. Maybe I don't respect you right now. But the feeling of responsibility is always there. That's the foundation. I share with you that when the Jews received the Torah on Mount Sinai, the entire nation is standing there around the mountain, and in the Midrashic literature, we're told that God picks up the mountain and says, accept my Torah, or you're going to die right here and now. I'll throw the mountain on top of your heads. Now, if you read the Torah itself, the Jews said, 
Nasa Vinishma. We want the Torah. We'll do, we'll listen, we're ready, give it to us. And just then God says, you have to take it. What exactly that means, he lifted up the mountain and threatened to kill them, doesn't make a difference. But there is almost a coercion involved. They were forced into accepting the Torah after they already agreed to do so. Why was that necessary? So one idea is, God wanted to make it clear. Right now, things are beautiful. You left Egypt, you saw miracles, you're inspired. It feels good to follow the Torah's instructions. It won't always be that way. You'll have many times throughout history where things will be very difficult. I want to let you know now that the commitment you're making today to accept the Torah has nothing to do about the fact that it feels good. I'm glad that it feels good and hopefully it always should. But to realize that this is a responsibility in all times, in all places. It's almost like you have the couple who've been dating for a while and now the big date is about to propose. And they're sitting by the beach together beautiful day and the waves are going back and forth, sitting in the sand, and he turns to her and says, Michelle, will you marry me? She says, Joey, I would love to. I've loved you all my life. And they embrace. And then he takes out a nine millimeter and puts it to her head and says, Michelle, will you marry me? What are you doing, Joey? She said yes already. What was God doing? The Jewish people said yes. The answer is, he wanted to make a point. The point is, no, it's not just because it feels good. It's a responsibility. That's our relationship with the Torah. But the same thing is true with our relationship with our spouse. It's not just when it feels good. It's not just when I understand where you're coming from or respect you or love you. But it's a responsibility. I have to make this work. Question. The way that it says it in the Midrashic source is that it was the Torah itself. Now again, what that means that God actually lifted up the mountain, it's hard to know. But there is some level of, of being pushed into it, although they already agreed. And the lesson is... Right, but this particular source is referring to the entire Torah, it sounds like. This is going to get us, I think, on a little bit of a different topic. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about this more afterwards. This gets more technical in nature. <laughs> it was some level of fear. It wasn't a fear, keep my commandments or I'll kill you. But it was more of a reverence. Realize this is a real obligation. Don't just do it because it feels right. Or it feels good now. You're accepting these instructions in every situation, even when it may be difficult. No, so, I, mean, but I, I think even the idea of fear, fear is a very healthy thing to feel. In a relationship, if you don't have any fear of what I might say, how are you going to feel about what I'm doing, and it's all lovey-dovey, but if I don't fear you, in a sense, I don't really love you. The idea of fear isn't that I'll strike you dead if you don't listen to me, but I'm nervous, I don't want to say the wrong thing, I don't want to hurt your feelings, I'm afraid of making you feel bad. That type of fear is very healthy in a relationship. I want to give a practical example here of commitment. We're saying that's the foundation, that's what everything's built upon. Here's an example. And this idea comes from a very, very good book I suggest you all get, The Death of Cupid by Rabbi Nachum Braverman. Wonderful book. And he has the following example. Mr. Brown goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, listen, your situation is worse than we anticipated. 
The best chance we have of saving your leg is by pursuing a series of operations. This will involve breaking and resetting a bone, removing all the infected tissue, and performing a number of skin grafts. There will be many periods of physical therapy, and you will have to radically alter your diet and lose at least 50 pounds. This is going to be a long process, but with aggressive action, I believe there is a reasonable chance we could save your leg. And now you, Mr. Brown, you have to make that choice. Do you want to go through this? If you're Mr. Brown, what do you say? No, just take the leg off now. I don't want that hassle. Would anyone say that? No. I'll do whatever I can to save that leg. That's commitment. I'm committed to my leg because it's part of who I am. And this is the idea we find in Jewish literature. It's called Ishto Kagufo. The husband and wife are as one. Just like in the initial creation, when we come together again, we become one, we become unified. And therefore, commitment stems from that reality that it's part of me. Just like you wouldn't give up on your leg. Well, you know what the doctor says, your leg is pretty good, but it's no longer fun. Okay, take it off. Your leg's no longer exciting. Okay, get rid of it. No, it's part of who I am. I'll do whatever I can to salvage that leg. That's what commitment means. In order to get to this level where we really view my spouse as part of me and I'll do whatever I can to keep myself intact, there's a distinction between pleasure and comfort. What's the definition of comfort? Simply stated, it's a lack of pain. It's a lack of doing something or experiencing something that is hard or difficult. Laying on the beach, reading a novel on the couch, that's comfortable. What is pleasure? So oftentimes real pleasure only comes through effort, only comes through some level of pain. If you want to master a musical instrument, that's a very, very pleasurable experience, getting up there and playing the violin, playing the piano. How do you get to that point? It takes work, it takes effort. You know, you're in the Olympics. Ever seen the, you know, when they win the gold, their level of excitement? That is the greatest moment of their lives. Do you know what it took to get there? Ever since this guy was two and a half years old, he was running the track and training and getting ready for that big day. And finally, when he's there and he's loving every second of it, he's standing with his arms raised victoriously, it's because you put a lot of effort into that. That's where real pleasure comes into play. Raising children is a great example of that. To try, I dare you, try to raise children without putting in any effort. It's impossible. By definition, it requires effort, pain, thought, energy. But at the same time, the greatest joy in life, the greatest love you'll have in life is a child. So when we're going into a marriage, or if we're in a marriage, we have to ask ourselves, am I trying to be comfortable or am I trying to be pleasurable? If the answer is I'm looking for comfort, the odds of that marriage lasting too long are very slim. Because just like raising children, just like accomplishing anything in the real world, it takes effort, it takes toil, it takes energy and focus. A marriage takes all of that as well. So how do we feel the level of commitment, of responsibility to have the building block for hopefully a very healthy and vibrant marriage? It's through going in with the realization, I'm not here to be comfortable. It doesn't work that way. But I'm here to have a good marriage. And that means I'm committed to make things work as much as I can. That takes work. But that's where the real pleasure comes into play. Well, it's more than that. Accomplishment is very pleasurable, but in the marriage itself, if you ever reach that state, and it's never a constant state of bliss that doesn't exist, except for in this book, but you have moments here and there where you're really feeling connected, you're really feeling, you know, the, this unit, this oneness. How long do they last? Not very long. But even if you get to that plateau once in a while, that's very pleasurable. The only way to get there, though, is putting in the effort. So commitment and responsibility is the foundation that we're trying to build off of. 
going in with the intent of pleasure versus comfort is the way to get there. What I'd like to explore next time is the second unique aspect of marriage, which is intimacy. Intimacy in a relationship sense and even in a physical sense. What is the Torah outlook on that as well? Hopefully next week we'll resume. Any questions or complaints? Jay. Something you can't live without. It's a hard one. It's a hard one because there's also a fine line between loving something, being attracted to that thing or person, but still maintaining some level of independence, which is always that fine balance in marriage. The idea of two halves becoming a whole, where just one conglomerate ball and I lose myself and you lose yourself, that doesn't work too well either. So even that thought, I can't live without you, might not be the, the thing to shoot for. I'm, I'm, I'm me and you're you. Together, we're able to enhance each other. Okay, yeah. I read the book, Not there, and, and and the movies don't help because all, all they do is they portray love in this in this foolish way that you might feel when you're dating when you're younger for a moment here or there, and then the majority of your life you're not feeling those same feelings, and you're asking yourself, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with this relationship? Why aren't we staring into each other's eyes endlessly? And the answer is that's not what love's about. And that's uh, the death of Cupid. I highly recommend getting that book. Okay, have a wonderful evening everybody.